Hey everyone. Okay, so we'll just give a minute and then start admitting people. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, so yeah, we can wait a couple of minutes. Okay, I'm going to start introducing and uh, and um, yeah, we can begin. So welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Camilo Otero, Artist Programs Manager at Center for Book Arts in New York. Before we begin the program, I'd like to acknowledge we're on ancestral and ceded territory of the Lenny Lenape people. For those of you who are new to CBA, Center for Book Arts is the oldest nonprofit dedicated to supporting the book arts through exhibitions, educational programs, studio access for artists, and a library and book art collection accessible to anyone who is interested in the matter. This event is being live streamed to our YouTube channel. We ask you to keep your mics in silence during the reading session. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Tonight, we present Human Artifacts, 2023 Spring Broadside Reading Series curated by Alison Parrish. This is the first session of two that will take place over Zoom today and next Thursday, June 1st at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. This reading is part of a series that has been going on for more than 20 years, and it gives the opportunity to visual artists and poets to work together. Addison Parrish is a computer programmer, poet, and game designer whose teaching and practice address the unusual phenomena that blossom when language and computers meet. She's an assistant professor arts professor at NYU's interactive telecommunications program. According to Ars Technica, Alison's work delights everyone. She was named best maker of poetry bots by the Village Voice in 2016 
and her zine of computer generated poems called Compasses received an honorary mention in the 2021 Pre Ars Electronica. Allison is the co creator of the board game Rewardable and author of several books, including At Every Word, the book, and Articulations. Her poetry has recently appeared in Bomb Magazine and Strange Horizons. Allison is originally from West Bountiful, Utah, and currently lives in Brooklyn. I'd like to give a special thank to our funders and everyone who donated to support this event and people who brought the broadsides. Remember that the broadsides are at a special prize until the end of the series. Welcome, Madison. Great. Um, thank you, Camilo. I actually have uh, some slides. Um, so let me share my screen really quick. Desktop two. All right, so um, this is indeed uh, human artifacts. I'm just gonna like go over my my curation stuff and, and talk a little bit about what I've been thinking about for this series. I do wanna thank the Center for Book Arts, first of all, um, for making this possible. Uh, it has been a real thrill to bring together, um, you know, my, my absolute uh, dream team of uh, collaborators for this project. Uh, all of my first choices said yes, which is amazing. And I'm uh, really excited about the work that has been coming out um, and really excited to hear everyone read tonight. So thank you so much to the Center for Book Arts and, and Camilo in particular for, for putting this together. Um, I'd also like to thank the Center for Book Arts for uh, being so cool with us doing this event online. I think, um, it's that's great because it, it's allowed um, the series to include people from all over the world as uh, makers and artists um, and also the audience. And uh, for those of us that are still uh, taking COVID precautions, it's uh, uh, like me, um, it's great to be able to participate in an event like this in the arts world where I don't have to worry about uh, catching COVID. Um, and I'd like to thank the artists and uh, the poets and the writers and the designers um, for all of the hard work that they've been putting in. And um, I've only caught glimpses of a couple of the broadsides, but all of them look extremely amazing and I can't wait to see more of them. Um, so I'm gonna talk, like I mentioned, about the, uh, the series. I'm gonna be really brief. Um, so there's this quote from Robert Pinsky that was in like a Wired magazine article in the 80s, but it stuck with me. Um, Robert Pinsky said, I find the computer utterly a human artifact. It reeks of us as do our trombones and cars and scissors and parades and pizzas. Technology is exactly like humanity. It is our baby and we are its. Um, what I find so great about this quote is that it kind of cuts computation down to size as just one technology of many others, including trombones and parades and pizzas. Um, and also emphasizes that, you know, computation doesn't result in things that are utterly alien. It results in things that are like us. Um, so this is my, my curatorial statement for the series, um, referencing that quote, the computer is Utterly a human artifact, according to poet Robert Pinsky. It reeks of us as do our trombones, cars, scissors, parades, pizzas. The poets, writers, and artists in the series use this human artifact, the computer, to produce creative text. Some provoke machine learning models, others write alongside them. Some shape digital text from the ground up bit by bit, while others use the internet to facilitate community participation. We find that the concerns and the aura of their works are unmistakably human, not despite their use of computation, but because of it. That's kind of what I'm trying to bring out with this series is that um, even though we are in a very interesting and turbulent time when it comes to the intersection of writing and technology, um, these technologies are still methods of expression and indelibly carry our um, uh, intention and expression with them. Um, in particular, I'm thinking of like the way that the uh, the situation is kind of panning out now where we have two sides and everybody is taking sides between these things. On the one side, there's OpenAI with ChatGPT. 
Um, and I have the boo and the hiss and the ug there. Uh, this is the the writers' union picket line is uh, saying these things um, versus like pure and wholesome old style human writing, um, as though these are two distinct things, right? This is a this is a taxonomy that's been imposed on us. Usually, the purpose of a taxonomy is to deny the alterities within those two categories, right? There's no such thing as pure and wholesome old style human writing, uh, just as much as computer generated writing is also not a uh, a monolithic thing. Um, what the series is intended to highlight is that writing has always been embedded in a series of different kinds of technologies and a series of different ways of writing that might count as computational even. Um, even before the invention of the computer, we have things like uh, the I Ching or uh, methods of creative writing like free writing or automatic writing. Um, all of these things kind of uh, bleed together into the tradition of computational writing or writing just that involves computers in general. In fact, I don't think these things can be separated. Um, another thing that I'm trying to emphasize in this series by bringing all of these folks together is, um, is to highlight that material matters, right? We think of texts that are computational as being sort of inherently in the cloud, so to speak, and don't have an actual physical form. But of course, that's not true. Even the cloud has an actual physical form. Um, all of us, are, of our images right now are going through data centers and, you know, uh, wires that are buried in the ground and uh, up in the sky and whatever all over the place. Um, but in particular, the material form of like the word on the written page, um, on the actual physical page is important to this process and it brings out different aspects of a text simply by virtue of the way that it's put into physical form. Um, and with this diagram, this is obviously not a complete diagram. There's We could keep on uh, making this mind map and go out into nodes all over the place. I put writing in the center of this, uh, of this mind map. Um, but writing is just one of the many disciplines in this rhizome. And, and in fact, not all of the participants in the series that you know, the series uh, as a whole demands that they be poets, um, but not all of the participants um, who are labeled by the series as poets consider themselves to be poets or even writers, um, which for me just emphasizes this fact that um, writing, creative writing, poetry, it exists inside of this giant rhizome that includes all kinds of computational tools, um, not just the late, the latest and greatest uh, chat GPT models. Um, so hopefully that explains a little bit about that. Um, I had fun making this uh, and drawing things and drawing the OpenAI logo. That was my fun exercise for the day. Um, so now I am going to stop sharing the screen and introduce the, um, we don't need to see my Zotero, uh, introduce the uh, first speaker or the first reader in the series. Um, the way that we're going to do this, I think, is that I am going to introduce the uh, the poet and the artist who is working with the poet, um, and then the uh, poet will uh, read and present, um, and then the artist will say something about the broadside as well, and then I'll introduce the, um, the next poet, um, and we'll do that for all three of the readers in the series. So... Um, the first reader tonight is... Amira Hanafi, um, who is a poet, cultural worker, and artist working with language as material. Their work uses systems, games, performance, and publishing to bring together communities of real and fictional characters who speak, interact, and sometimes exchange identities. Amira's work has been shown widely online and in offline spaces around the world, most recently at the Fifth International Biennial of Casablanca and at uh, Les Abattoirs Musée in Toulouse, France. Um, they are the author of the books Forgery and Minced English, a number of limited edition print works, and a growing number of works of electronic literature, including as part of the transdisciplinary project, A Dictionary of the Revolution, which is a work that I assigned to my students, and we always have useful discussions about it. Um, Amira is currently writer in residence at Coastal Carolina University, where they teach creative writing and work on projects that aim to constitute language for fluid identities and border crossing bodies. Um, 
Amira is like one of my favorite writers, one of my favorite workers in, um, in new media art. So it's a real pleasure to have Amira today. Um, Amira has been working with um, Alison Carter Bollet, who is a printmaker, poet, and teacher from Calgary, Alberta, and the administrative assistant at Center for Book Arts. Um, Alison holds a Bachelor of Science in Biology with a double major in English Literature from the University of British Columbia and an MFA in Poetry at Columbia University, where she was awarded the inaugural Max Ritva Poetry Fellowship. You can find Allison in, in New York, either at the foot of a letterpress or waiting for the L train to take her to a letterpress. Um, so there we go. Take it away, Amira. Hi. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction, Allison. Um, you are also um, one of my favorite uh, writers. Um, so it's really, really um, like flattering and a pleasure to be here. Um, and to talk about um, the project that I worked with Allison on uh, turning into a broadside. Um, and that uh, project is called A Language Act. Um, I'm going to, um, in my reading time, um, give um, a little bit of um, the first part, I'll talk a little bit about the background um, to this project, A Language Act, and um, then um, we will um, listen to the computer read a little bit of the um, document itself. And then I'm going to share um, a few poems um, that I've written myself. Um, so I'm going to share uh, my screen, uh, which will just be, uh, for the most part, text um, that I'm reading so that you can follow along. I always find that to be sort of helpful. So um, I'm going to do that. Uh, in the summer of 2020, um, I posted the text of HR 997 to a Google document and opened it to the public for edits. I invited people who know more than one language to contribute a translation of any part of the document into another language. Um, you're invited to participate in the project now by following this link and contributing a translation. There will, you'll find some more instructions there. Um, I'll share it in the chat, although I, I know also some people are listening by live stream. Um, so it's a pretty simple um, link that you can type into your address bar. So uh, what you'll find in this um, document is HR 997, which is also known as the English Language Unity Act of 2019. It's a piece of proposed legislation that if passed would establish an official language for the United States, which does not have uh, an official language. There is another version of the act currently in Congress and there have been um, many versions preceding it. Um, my invitation is a performative material refusal of the proposed uniformity of official English, of the smoothness of an imagined monolingualism. Uh, participants um, alter the text uh, using different alphabets and vocabularies, something you might be doing right now. The text is thus made and remade, disfigured and reconfigured. The document remains open for edits, subject to change in a perpetually open collaborative space. The language there that emerges is thus fluid, polyvocal and translingual. So you uh, may know uh, that the United States of America is a nation founded through the practice of settler colonialism. Um, strategies of displacement and values of uniformity and homogeneity are essential to this nation building project, including the forced removal of indigenous people and their replacement by invasive settlers who aim to occupy the land in perpetuity, as well as the violent relocation of large numbers of people from the African continent in the specific case of the United States. Um, the ideology that underpins um, these spatial practices of displacement also finds manifestation in the development of cultural artifacts in the young nation, uh, including language. All of the founders of the United States of America were of British descent. Um, among other languages, they spoke English. The Declaration of Independence and the Constitution that established this country were drafted and ratified in English. And by doing uh, that, composing the nation's founding documents in the English language, 
The founders imagined a population of citizens who shared English as a common language. And I'll read a quote um, from uh, John Jay in uh, the Federalist Papers uh, in 1788 that demonstrates this sort of ideology. Uh, Providence, uh, quote, Providence has been pleased to give this one connected country to one united people, a people descended from the same ancestors, speaking the same language, professing the same religion, attached to the same principles of government, very similar in their manners and customs. So these homogenous people that Jay describes did not exist on this continent, but it was by delineating them and by marginalizing others that this population could be brought into being. Although it's impossible to arrive at a countable number, scholars estimate that there were several hundred often widely divergent indigenous languages spoken on this land before Colombian contact. Um, as Africans were forcibly displaced to the continent, Arabic and other African languages were also spoken here. Um, so initially, the nation's founders relied on the exclusion of speakers of those languages from access to citizenship or to legal personhood in order to conceal those languages and begin to fashion a state of monolingualism. The omnipresence of their languages was manifestly ignored. Uh, later, the state's tactics would turn to displacement and erasure. Another example of the covert establishment of monolingualism in the United States materializes in the work of William Thornton, who was a British American designer who created a plan for the US uh, Capitol building. Um, in his essay on Thornton, uh, Peter Minoche situates um, the architectural plan for the Capitol within the context of a larger philosophical system that uh, Thornton laid out in his 1793 work, Cadmus, or a treatise on the elements of written language. So in this uh, book, uh, Thornton proposes a universal orthography, which is a common system of writing and spelling to represent the sounds of language in a consistent and standardized way. Remarkably, Thornton wants this alphabet to be used to represent all of the world's languages. Uh, he declares, we must first fix all the sounds. Minoche points out that despite uh, Thornton's claims upon the universal, his proposed system actually normalizes English as a universal standard of all human speech. The majority of characters in his orthography already exist in the English alphabet. Moreover, in order to achieve uniformity, the orthography imposes English sounds and spellings onto other languages. His system promotes not only a linguistic hegemony for English, but a cultural hegemony for US Americans as the superior authors of its conventions. Next, we'll have a look at this document um, that was produced through um, the invitation. Um, you'll see uh, here, um, is a version in which I've accepted all the changes that were suggested. Um, uh, maybe you would like to uh, suggest another change. Um, the a version that's uh, been used for the broadside um, uh, does something a little bit different that perhaps um, Allison will talk about um, when, she, um, when she talks about the broadside. Um, but what I wanna do now is listen to my Mac OS X chosen voice reading this document. And we'll do that for um, just a couple of minutes. One hundred sixteen degrees Congreso Primera Sesión, Declaró Inglés en cuanto lengua oficial dos páginas estadis maricé, des edits unis, establecer una uniformidad na lengua inglesa como regra para naturalizaseo, y para evitar más interpretasos dos textos respetantes a las na lengua inglesa stanos chidnoxenich. Pursuant to Congress SILOPS to provide for the general coup stanols chidnoxenich and to establish a uniform rule of naturalization under Article I, Section 8, of the Constitution. Name of Camara de Representants February 6, 2019 Iowa Crowley, Kendasi, Bay Allen, Bay Massey, Bay McClintock Ve Bay Perry Ison, Asajitaki Kanunu Sundu, Ejidim Venemic Coitus in Bilardalan and in addition to the Committee on the Judiciary for a period to be subsequently determined by the Speaker, in each case for consideration of such provisions as fall within the jurisdiction of the committee concerned, a bill for a declarer angelsk som debt to declare, 
as the officially Juntini evolves to Jukalva, to Edeblir establish a uniform Imglase Death Angelsk Sprague language rule for naturalization, and to avoid Angelis and Yanlis Yakulandarilmasi texts of the laws of the United States, pursuant to Congress powers to provide for the general welfare of the United States and to establish a uniform Tasikli of naturalization under Antrist I, Section 8, De La Constitution be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of in Congress Assemble. Section 1. Cisvixmus may be cited as the Ting ANH Language Unity Act of 2019 inches. SEC 2. Findings. Congress Oswe Adxa. Konastapuj. 1. America's Forneed State or the United States or Komponorate AF is composed of individual individuals fra diverse from diverse etniniu, culturiniu irlingvistiniu and continues to dridge for to af benefit from this Tertingus Ivorovs. 2. Throughout least war of the United States, den samlin tra den ro tra the common thread binding individuals of fra for skullige vagrant differing backgrounds has been the Anglu Kalba. 3. And otherwise to promote the sprash within the respective states, subject to the prohibitions enumerated in the Constitution of the United States and in laws of the respective states. SEC 3. English as official language of the United States. One thing I would like to point out about that reading is that um, this computer uh, has decided to um, only um, pronounce the um, text which is written in using the Latin uh, alphabet. So finally, um, to end my reading, I will read some poems. Um, these poems um, were composed using um, uh, material that I collected uh, through um, Google, uh, Google, Google, <laughs> Google search. <laughs> uh, and this first one, um, which I call English, is uh, composed using um, a Google search for the phrase, my other country is. My other country is a democracy. My other country is available. My other country is Honduras. My other country is Australia. My other country is a small island. My other country is in the Commonwealth. My other country is broke. My other country is a paradise. My other country is doing quite well. My other country is for the world. My other country is Canada. My other country is in South America. My other country is right next door. My other country is also stepping up. My other country is a superpower. My other country is Taiwan. My other country is less than complimentary. My other country is folded away. My other country is Paraguay. My other country is a blowtorch of capitalism. My other country is eliminated. My other country is a bit wrong-headed. The second part, um, which is uh, called, uh, translated from the Arabic or the Arabic, um, is uh, co composed from bits that I found um, using a Google search for the phrase baladi and akhar, which uh, is in, translated into English, um, my other country. Um, first I'll read it in Arabic and then I will read it in English translate, translation. Yaktil ibn baladi ibn baladi al akhar. وهذا هو بلدي الآخر سلمي عن المكان أشكر الوليات المتهدة بلدي الآخر للسماح المزهرات سأهاجر إلى بلدي الآخر أتمنى من الله عز وجل أن يحمي بلدي الآخر سوريا أهل ذكريات الطفولة بلدي الآخر ولم تعد بي رغبة في العودة إلى بلدي الآخر الذي لم عد أن تني إليه ولم يعد هو الآخر يحتم بي لا أستطيع أن أمارس هنا في بلدي الآخر سوريا وكأن بلدي الآخر فأنا أحس أني بلدي أن أنا أني في بلدي الآخر الإمارات بلدي الآخر وهو الإعراق كل الحب والاحترام إلا بلدي الآخر دولة الكويت الصوت العربي الحر هو بلدي الآخر بتكلم عن بلدي الآخر عن وطني 
alladhi waldatun fi. The men of my other country kill my countrymen. That's what's negative about my other country. I thank the United States, my other country, for allowing demonstrations. I will migrate to my other country. I pray to God Almighty to protect my other country, Syria, the best memories of my childhood, my other country. I no longer desire to return to my other country where I no longer belong. The other is no longer interested in me. I cannot practice it here in my other country, Syria, and like my other country, I felt I was in my other country, the Emirates. My other country is Iraq. Love and respect to my other country, the state of Kuwait. Free Arab voice is my other country. I'm talking about my other country, my home where I was born. And finally, I'll read the third part of this poem, uh, which is entitled, What Would I Say? After a, a Facebook app that some of you might uh, remember um, that would um, take your statuses, your Facebook statuses and remix them and make up new statuses. So that material is what I used to create um, this final poem. Maybe I'll take the pyramids back home because I am happy, back home in the past, but the people, we were happening persons come ashore. We were just told that there never was a kind of world, and yet I am safe. I'm here till the way it is important. I meant an easy city, but whatever, as if nothing were easier, we're staying inside you. I'm here till the end of the perishing. They taught us to kill them. This text is how I will do whatever it takes to make your right to participate in the West. The guy who volunteered to take politics altogether seriously. The guy who gave an accurate identification. Yes, and artists. So inwardly, I did nothing. Glad to know how to remain optimistic while living inside history. Thank you. I'll pass it on to Allison now. Well, thank you so much. Um, and it's a delight to be here. Um, I'm a big fan of Alison Parrish's and now a big fan of Mira Hanafi. It's been really uh, wonderful to work with you. So um, the broadside that we created together is this one that is behind me. Um, I'll also share this image of it. Um, so Although my bio definitely gives the impression that letterpress is my first love, um, this is printed in five colors freezograph. Um, when Amira and I were discussing how best to approach this project, it became pretty clear that letterpress was not the vibe. It was not the way to go. Um, because this is based on a Google Doc that has it invites interceptions, it invites interference. Um, I think one of the things that you said, Amir, was disfigured and reconfigured. And to print something letterpress and deboss it into the page felt like a comment on its stability um, and the, the permanence thereof. And so we went instead with Resograph. Um, the thing with Resograph, a few things that made it kind of lend itself towards this project are that the ink itself never really fully dries. It is kind of an open document. You can still kind of intercede on it in one way or another, which can be a very frustrating thing as a printer, but in this case, uh, seemed to spiritually function with the text. It's, uh, it overlays and creates new mixes and colors. And you can see I've kept the strike throughs in the, in the color of the first language to translate the, the English text. So there are a few cases here where there are, um, there are, several different languages translating the same word, um, but I tried to keep it consistent. And so there isn't a color that's used for any one language. Um, this is typeset in times, which is one of the most broadly expansive typefaces for, uh, for different languages and different um, orthographies. And so the, the spirit, I think, of the Google Doc was very much 
the driving force behind the design. Um, we wanted to make something that still felt maybe like it was ready to be interceded upon that could still be intercepted um, with the strike throughs and kind of you are suggesting in this document and this document still looks like something that is having suggestions made on it. Um, so the threads of every strike through are not fully woven into the page. They're not debossed. They're really sitting on top of it. They're unwoven aspects of the of the tapestry that these people and Amira facilitated this um, created together and are continuing to create. So in the colophon text, it says this broadside reflects the living document as of April 2023. Um, although it is not an exact replica of the Google Doc, it is a very good representation of what it looked like at that point. Um, so yeah, that is this one. The other thing, the last thing I'll say about the design is that it is printed uh, on paper that is eight and a half by 14. So it is a legal size document, um, but everything else is colorful and vibrant and uh, hopefully still very much alive. Um, all right, thank you, Amira and Allison. It was fantastic. <laughs> the, uh, knowing that the broadside is printed with uh, risograph like does actually change the way that I look at it. Um, so thank you both for uh, sharing your work. Next up is um, Lillian Yvonne Bertram. Um, Lillian uh, Bertram is an African-American writer, poet, artist, and educator who works at the intersection of computation, AI, race, and gender. They are the author of Travesty Generator from Noemi Press, which is a book of computational poetry that received the Poetry Society of America's 2020 Anna Rabin uh, Rabinowitz Prize for interdisciplinary work and was long listed for the 2020 National Book Award for Poetry, another book that I <laughs> assign in my classes and we always have a great discussion about. Um, they are the recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Poetry Fellowship. Their other poetry books include How Narrow My Escapes, Personal Science, A Slice from the Cake Made of Air, and But a Storm is Blowing from Paradise. Their fifth book, Negative Money, is forthcoming from Soft School Press in 2023. Uh, Lillian Yvonne was working with Wei Yin Chen, who is a graphic designer based in Brooklyn, New York, specializing in branding, exhibition, print, and editorial design. She is working with Lucky Risograph as a designer. Also, she is currently part of the School of Visual Arts Student uh, for Design slash Designer as Entrepreneur Program. She is interested in exhibition, brand identity, and editorial design, and in general, how design and life can complement and collaborate with each other. She desires to bring passion for converting ideas and senses of human feeling into visual language. So uh, Lillian Yvonne, I will invite you to take the floor. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Allison, for inviting me to be part of this, um, this amazing cohort of poets and artists. Thank you to the Center for Book Arts also for putting this on and, and sponsoring the materials and everything. I feel like my camera is kind of crappy. I'm sorry about that. I just don't. <laughs> this is this is just this is the computer that I have. So <laughs> that, that's what we're going with. Um, uh, it was really exciting to work with Wei-Yan. Um, the, the process was, you know, I I invited her to interpret the poems visually, how how she felt, and it's always exciting for me to see to see how what artists do um, with the work, which is behind me. These examples um, of the broadsides, and so the text that I gave to Wayun were a series of poems from a web based poetry generator that I made a while ago, um, and I'm going to share my screen. Let me figure out how to do it. All right, there we go. And so this is a, a poetry generator called Forever Gwen Brooks, and it's an homage to the poet Gwendolyn Brooks. And what it does is with each press of this white button down here is it generates a new version of a poem by Gwendolyn Brooks called An Aspect of Love Alive in the Ice and Fire. And it's the ending book to ending poem to her book Riot, which was published in 1969. And that entire book, it's a very short book. Um, is a response to the, to the riots and the assassination um, of Martin Luther King Jr. And so what I did is this is a very sort of simple, I mean, it's computationally simple template-based generator in which um, the poem itself is turned into a template with some constants and some variables. 
and the variables, the things that change, um, our words are swapped out for, for words, other words that occupy the same parts of speech um, from the rest of the book. So it's this sort of self-contained universe of sort of seemingly infinite versions of this poem using Gwendolyn Brooks's own language. And so in, in that sense, since the, the things that stay constant, like the grammar and the syntax doesn't change, there are lots of things that sort of sound sort of mashed up and jammed together and don't necessarily make um, sense. But at the same time, I feel that the resulting poems still contain and maintain a lot of the sentiment that this poem carries in the book. Um, so the web address for this is forevergwenbrooks.com. So you can all like go to it and play with it and, you know, see what comes up. Um, the poem, I'm just going to stay there. The poem, I'm going to stop sharing. The poem that is in the broadside um, that Wayun chose is called An Aspect of Time Alive in the Radio and Bluff. It is the jazz of our sermon. In a world in fire, there is this they. How richly. Twenty shelf in our sky, it are we hear each other, our white fume and story. Responsible light is in the camaraderie. Because the chili is at the lover, we cannot purr very long. They is, although decently, it are in yourself again. It is their little forward lord, them long straddled thousandfold and settled as a joy. In sculpture, he steal little direct. There is a moment in seas when foreigners is not to be understood. I cannot bear riot. This is the 20 gut, the ranks of not to end. On the street we say, we made in terrific directions down the nighttime street. So I mean, one of the things about this generator really is that again, every, every click of the button is different. And so I'm, I'm going to read some more of the poems that I, I gave to Wayun. Um, and you can, again, you can play with the generator on your own. In a sense, it's like the, the ones that I have here um, in my document aren't going to reoccur <laughs> elsewhere if, if, you, if you click the button. So there's a lot. It's a very ephemeral generator. It doesn't store any data. So each of the poems generated is, is the only one. And unless you save it, you know, by copying and pasting, um, when you click the button again, it's gone. An aspect of arabesques alive in the maxim and lagoon. It is the chatter of our fume. In a bull in passion, there is this we, how imperturbable. Neat years in our haunches, me loaded, we long stomped each other, our different flowers and curse. Long straddled light is in the cabinet. Because the mornings is at the head, we cannot stir very long. He told, although red, we are in yourself again. They consumed your forward responsible chains, it down velvet and forgot as a hurt. In wire, yourself held young, respectable. There's a moment in gentlemen when joy is not to be understood. I cannot bear chili. This is the young lover, the wine of not to end. On the street we told, we offend in imperturbable directions down the clean street. An aspect of package alive in the sculpture and joy. It is the mornings of our West. In a room in blackness, there is this he, how imperturbable. Terrific darkness in our lion, it do, we are each other, our lean pig and blackness. Golden light is in the twelve. Because the fudge is at the sin, we cannot, rising very long. I are, although not to end, you are in themselves again. I rattle their sweet, beautiful guns, you responsible, direct, and inverting as a chitterling. In smoke, she crunched desperate rough. There is a moment in chains when fume is not to be understood. I cannot bear place. This is the remarkable jaguar, the glory of not to end. On the street we keep, we eating in almost directions down the white street. An aspect of wind sweep, alive in the jazz and children. 
It is the nobody of our chitterling. In a maxim in junk, there is this they, how cheap. Forward sin in our street, it were we make each other are instead town and wind sweep. However, light is in the black. Because the mother woman is at the sky, we cannot say very long. We rattle, although second you are in itself again. We laugh, her merely nourished philosopher, they little decently and unheard as a pig. In smoke, we are, however, unafraid. There is a moment in sculpture when food is not to be understood. I cannot bear keeper. This is the discreet sonatas, the mornings of not to end. On the street, we wrapped. We do, in golden directions, down the self-accepting street. So these poems, um, the generator lives lives online, and um, from time to time I play with it. And so some of the the lines and constructions from those from the generator poems wind up in my own work. Um, that that's how I sort of preserve them from their ephemeral nature. And so I'll end with a poem from my forthcoming book. Uh, uh, the book is called Negative Money, and the poem is called Demagogue Money. And you'll probably hear resonances and, and lines in this in the form of this generator um, in the poem. Demagogue money. I cannot bear pigs. Sensational pig and his black food stomp to some top. False sonatas spit raging. The cheddar of our troubles is an aspect of breath, glass pulled from fire, the wool of our ensemble. I cannot bear time. In the each other, there is this desperate we crying down and across each other getting older. Getting closer is the room behind the door before the door to it gets worse. There are moments I cannot bear law and it's hot white golden rattles. On the street we hiss, on the street we blare. In white directions, America is expensive. On the street we eat. It's malnourished sermon, the cabinet of our chains. I'll turn it over to Wei Yun and I'll pop in the chat the web address to that generator. Thank you so much. Hello. Let me share my screen. Okay. So yeah, I'm Wei Yun and thank you for coming and listening. I'm really excited to and thanks for Center of, for Book Arts to have me in this section. And so happy to be able to work with Lillian. So let, let me tell you a, a little bit about how this come out and like a, uh, the whole process of the things kind of. So Alive, Alive in the Radio and Beloved is a poem creating by Lillian using computer generated and just like what she, she's told, talk about. And I expanding this idea using computer generated to create this pattern for the background. There are four different kinds of patterns both generated from the same coding. The pattern expressed the feeling after reading the poem and how I interpret the poem. Coding is something so rigid, but behind those written code can generate this like beautiful, beautiful abstract pattern by itself. Each of the pattern is creating by this complex context so did the poem. Those patterns serving serves as the official dialogue with the poem, showcasing the interplay between rejected, rejected and beauty, beauty. Despite the inherent structure of, of coding, this pattern organically unfold and refilling their own comp complexities and official language. I using letter press to print the print in sor source code, which is a mono typeface, to showcase the coding language filling for me and for the poem. On top of the four variation three colors risograph printing. The reason I choose the blue color because of the the scene when I while reading Lillian poem, it bring me the feeling about freedom and mystery. It is a complicated feeling while reading through the whole poem, so I made the decision to use different blue color to mix the gradient to show the transition between each feeling. 
And I, I really want to, through this project, I hope to engage your audience in a, a multi-dimension exploration that uh, bridge the boundaries between Indians, inviting them to discover new perspective and interpretation of the original poem while appreciate the beauty that em emerge from the converg convergence of human expression and computational process. Thank you. Uh, all right, thank you, Lily and Yvonne and uh, Wei Yun. That was fantastic. Um, sorry, <laughs> I'm super energized by this reading for some reason. Um, the next reader in uh, uh, tonight and the final reader tonight is Everest Pipkin. Um, Everest is a game developer, writer, and artist from Central Texas who lives and works on a sheep farm in southern New Mexico. Their work both in the studio and in the garden follows themes of ecology, tool making, and collective care during collapse. When not at the computer in the heat of the day, you can find them in the hills spending time with their neighbors, both human and non-human. Um, Everest was working with Kazlan Yoon, who is a graphic designer based in New York. Her design practice aims to challenge methods of expression and uncommon familiarity with a focus in experimentation, conceptualizing, and craftsmanship. She enjoys exploring different worlds of art for uh, different worlds of art forms and incorporates her discoveries of diverse media in her designs. Um, so uh, Everest, uh, go ahead and uh, share your work. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, first off, I live quite rurally and my internet is doing a fun new thing where it is um, sort of just dropping intermittently as opposed to sort of being unilaterally slow. So if I disappear, uh, I'll come back in about 45 seconds to a minute. I don't know what this is, but you'll have to bear with me. Hopefully it won't happen. Um, so when Allison first asked if I'd be interested in participating in this broadside series, I paused, to be honest. Um, and that's because computational poetry in 2023 is a little bit wrought, uh, enough so <laughs> that a lot of my work has migrated into longer formats um, that deal with networks and hyperlinks and formal HTML elements and iframes and material stuff of the internet in situ, and a lot less with the language and structure that can kind of be gleaned off of it. Um, and I really wasn't sure if any of this newer work would even fit on a single page broadside, much less thrive there. It really seemed like the format was asking for a simple poem. And I've written or maybe co-written poems in this traditional sense, um, but it's been some time. But I, I kind of thought, I was like, well, maybe, maybe I'll return to some of that work and see how it would feel almost a decade later now. Um, and being back there, reading that work that I was producing from about 2013 to 2017, I found that I really missed this process um, because this was generative text exploration that was built out of hand curated data sets, one off algorithms um, that was produced out of working code documents that lived in flow. Um, it was programmed with a poet's understanding of all the borders and uh, breakages of language um, that understood the materiality it was made from and which ran with all of those capacities of the handmade small data set. Um, data sets that were gathered with care, with contributor consent, and with curatorial vision. Uh, in planning and thinking about this, I, I went back to this lecture I put together in 2018, which was about curatorial intent and in small data sets, which included this line, like, as the core and fundamental benefit of hand constructing source material. Um, and this line was, the hand curated data set is able to deal with the original creators of the material represented inside as humans and as collaborators and as artists in and of themselves, not just as abstractions or as data points. To gather is to believe in the value of specificity and place, even if it is just a place on the internet, and to put trust in one's care for those things which really does get at the fundamental tragedy of large language models accepting maybe the way that they intersect with labor. Um, so all this to say, I, I did end up selecting some work from a 2015 chapbook, um, Picking Figs in the Garden While My World Eats Itself. As a body of work, it is pretty pastoral. 
uh, very romantic poetry. Uh, even at the time, it was very much computational poetry in the mud and in the flowers. The book feels really naive now, um, certainly idealistic, but I'll tell you what, the material it was constructed from was deeply loved. Um, each poem in Picking Figs was generated uh, by one-off kind of living code built as it went with specific source material from historic letters to Wikipedia entries to plant identification manuals. And um, I thought I'd read a couple of things both from the chapbook and from kind of work in and around that era of my practice. So um, the first one I'm going to read is the first one that felt like more than an exercise or a little experiment, but also, of course, it was both of those things. Um, the one movie with the cowboy and his wound. I stays down. I blow kissed numbers higher than a few, eight, ten. You set tiger traps in the flower, the ribbon. My nature pales. I burns. Tell me again why we are always hurtling the tall buildings, worry lines, porch. I wanted a tree house, ex-husbands, in-laws, electronic equipment, you name of the great white, white bird. I wanted Win Billion and the one movie with the cowboy and his wound. Sometimes I am that horse and angry to war, to blanket of snow. Like the roses, we kiss the iron pinprick stars of me. Then I curled up in the fever and slept in the back seat of your barren expanse. So after this, I started iterating on the code base, um, again, kind of working in situ, working in document um, towards mouthfeel, towards sound aroundness, implementing these rules towards slant rhymes or particular cadence formants, reading outputs, changing rule sets, saving off bits and pieces. Um, and this next poem, poem is, is kind of from a little farther along that process. I walk and I enhance things. If you eat the spring, you will be of lodestone, word vexations and crosses and deeds. Two swallows the dust, fragments their wings. The next day, way plate. The next day, way place being. Come, call bells still hunting. Come, the winter, the field. Come, forgetting this river, the, the future dream that hardens into character. But pile of flowers, bright days, the affection and in Rose Bay. Oh, fire says, mend my life. You hold the lucky number. 2,000 rooms, still scared, as the sun, the desperate notes, that dream you carry was part air. So one of the advantages of this type of generative practice is that you can form the code to an idea, not vice versa, or not expecting your code to have infinite types of forms and outputs like per individual piece of algorithm. Um, a fair amount of the computational poetry in this book is not really readable out loud. Uh, a lot of it deals with... Um, uh, punctuation and grammar that is just not uh, pronounceable. Um, but this poem is right on the edge. This out of everything in the book is classic landscape poem as it gets. Um, again, very romantic, um, but it's a destabilizing thing, kind of breaking farther and farther into component language as it goes. The stirring seeds, a rising tide, a cracked gas pipeline, a hurricane rain, a rolling sky, the last of summer's fruit, the buckling earth, a reaching pine, a clever child, the stones, last night's embers, the morning heat of the first flowers, a rising seed, an abandoned waterfall, the bright pollen of winter rye, rye grass, the bright, the seasonal stream of molten rock, a bolt of the sea of drying grass, the last of the first flowers, rising heat of the deep green moss, the burning dew, a single cinder of summer's lights, embers, a puddle, of sinking ivy, the creeping into mud, a sing tide, tiny waterfall in powers, a cracked garden, leaking green morning grass, the arching star cane rain, a sudden rock falling tide, a tiny water bottle rocket, a fall, a gift of light, a rotting starless leaking into mud, burning clouds, rotting clouds, an army of summer. The buckling snowmelt river child, the sinking green of stream child, the last of winter child, the bright pollen of wire, green open winter bottle, a well sound, the stones, a ream, a leaking earth, to permafrost flowers, a bolton rock, the seeds, a crack it, the arching, the rocked green of mud, a well sounder, interdam open abandoner, and hope-lined garden of the powers, a sudless earth, 
a rolling star, a well in patch, the sounders, a water lass, a war patch hilled, affel, soundond, winter bon, e, to, lo, pond, s, a, m, fl, er, wis. Um, and here's the last poem that I'm going to read from Picking Figs. This is uh, We Leaped Again of Butterflies. We've leaped again of butterflies, jasmine, the California, the wind. Like ants crawling, bickerings between me, I invest in the hospital and spend another hour pouncing death. How badly I was beautiful, such a fragile creature of leaving, gaps in background and even the wild things. I think myself salt, and also the wound. I will seek entrance to which secret aqueduct the lion bellowing into grace. You are the master at whistles, you will free and fire on fire, for uh, the ocean cradle. Brutal is a generic name. Stop, because the dreamer has caused without the sun here, my poor fragile you stop that butterfly dead in one action, or one welling forth. One, history is wide as the whole world so few that cold sea would harm. Two, ten squashed the butterfly of the bookshelf. Light enters you, and materials, high quality. Vineyards need water. I do hope you called here. Jasmine cultivation of life intact. It's up, up to wide waiting to dream earnestly. I, as we, useless, mannered insect, the lion leaped into you. Broken I open, and lion asked the world. There was not enough water, we said. Did I tell you of the butterfly that flew into the ocean or raced for hours until, at my own door, I would come into the joy of ordinary kindness, the rising water dream? Um, and here's a couple poems that weren't picking figs, but um, used like similar construction techniques, kind of built out of the same files. Uh, the following is... Uh, after a painting, so sort of taking key terms, expanding them out with concept nav into a series of related ideas, matching words and phrases. I have mailed you this close up of a person's face, a parent with children all about during the US winter. I have done this because I want to be outstanding, dearer, material, and remote to talk soft like mammals over long distances with someone in tears. The sun shone in their faces, a lot of smiles, a neck held tightly, a voice trained open, the opening of an envelope, the envelope. Um, and then this one is a deletion poem scavenged out of a much larger body of text, kind of automatic blackout poetry, uh, naming a child Adam. We passed the night in silence, splitting sea and finding it did make salt, that common crystal, but also seat and eat. So we did. How boring, our bodies, these words, indivisible only on some plane of poetry, digesting it's easy enough to tongue all the spaces in the joinery. Still, what use is a rib, an apple, a tasteful home, without that redness tender bone, each mangled cutting, each farther test, to get at a fundamental particle, to grasp it than to let it slip. And then finally, before I hand off, I thought I should read the work that actually forms the text of the broadside, um, the ABC model of flower development. When I was a child, how badly I wanted those few flowers inundated. You and I, resolute sea, green, green stems over while I water looked like a city, one hand fed plant, watching for a lifeboat memory. The coffee is polished by rain. By afternoon, I reach new shining, where the unhappiness have their pictures with the sea, the camera flashing and the curl I, I am aware of at once, both the sign of the streetlight and the sound of the crosswalk, those attendant angels tearing the light for better things. Okay. Thank you for listening to me. I'm so excited to hear about the construction of this beautiful piece. Thank you, Everest. Let me share my screen. Okay.
So the poem that I chose was the ABC Model Flower Development. And I'd like to first thank everyone that put this event together, those who gave me feedback on my design and everyone who I bothered at CBA. On that day, I printed all of this out. Thank you so much. So um, I was paired with Everest and of course it was such an honor to work with such a cool person. And Everest's contagious excitement and appreciation made this experience so fun. So thank you so much. Okay, to give a brief description about this broadside, the poem is letterpressed and the illustration in the back is rezo printed on carbon copy paper or what we know as, as receipt paper. And the illustration was ma machine generated for this specific poem and was provided by Everest. And also there are perforations and flower punched holes on the edges so that when you rip one side, um, it unveils the illustration below, below it. And I have some progress photos that I wanna show everybody. This was like the first draft on the illustrator. And here is some letterpress action, the metal type, setting up the metal type, using a model typeface typeface called Elite. Cancel on I don't think we're seeing oh, your um really your okay image. Do you guys see it now? Yes. Okay. Sorry. All right, so here it's a draft. And then the metal type, setting up each letter. The first print, which had many errors, upside down eyes, some periods that didn't show through. And here it is locked up on the bed. This was a very humbling experience. And here's a risograph print. Okay, so the reason why I chose this poem out of the three that was provided is because it left a really strong impression. It was short, but not sweet, rather bittersweet to me because it reminded me of life, childhood, and the genes that we are made of, similar to flowers. So here it is underneath the poem. There we go. I have it right here. No. Well, that's it. Thank you. Um, all right. Thank you, Everest and Castle. That was amazing. Um I think we have uh, on the on the run of show. We had time for questions. Is that something we're still doing? Yes, we can have a few minutes for comments, questions, uh, interventions. So, <laughs> anyone who who wants to make a comment, they may speak. Just want to say how truly like lovely and wonderful this has been and I was so looking forward to hearing from all of the poets and collaborators and just hearing about the process and it's just been really beautiful to hear so thank you all for participating this is just great yeah I just add to that um really and Yvonne that that um it's wonderful to be in the in the kind of room with um with folks whose whose work um, I know and and follow and am a fan of, and it's just really it's wonderful to to be to be brought together in this way. Um, thank you for that, Allison, and everybody at um, at Center for Book Arts for making this possible. <laughs> yeah, I uh, not to, not just to pile on to the appreciation but truly uh it's it's been a really exciting um process and uh I have 
loved seeing something that often feels somewhat nebulous or within kind of the the ether of computational programming of um, text files materialized in such a physical way and with such attention and care. Um, we had some really fabulous conversations and, and talking about the materiality of broadside and about the type of paper and about using and reusing um, t techniques that maybe feel you know, like uh, dated, but aestheticized and deeply human in this way, which I feel like is also reflective in these poems <laughs> in uh, a new era of generative text. It was it was a very exciting process, and it has me um, delighted by the medium again in a way that I haven't felt in some time. So thank you. Well, I want to thank everyone today for uh, being with us and um, and for such an amazing afternoon, evening. And um, I really look forward uh, to the next session. We still have one more session next week, uh, June 1st. So I invite you all to uh, join in and um, listen to the set. Um, to the poets, uh, Harry, Joseph, and Jills, um, um, Janelle Shane, Janelle Shane, I'm and sorry, yeah, and uh, Kay Alado. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, yeah, thank you very much, and uh, we will see you next week, Allison, again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.